The first thing people see about me is that I'm Muslim. Literally, women have no rights. You are a piece of property. I've received death threats that they hope ISIS will gang rape me. If women are free to be naked, why should they not be free to be covered? Muslim women have been on the news a lot lately. Are they oppressed? Are they forced to wear the headscarf? Are they even allowed to speak? The men won't let the women speak. They speak for them. I'm here in Minnesota in the heart of America, where Islamophobia is impacting many Muslim women, particularly harassment, violations. But fear is not an American value, and I intend on having fearless conversations. the entire family. A lot of non-Muslims, what they hear of Islam is jihad, sharia law, oppression of women. The disconnect between that understanding and between how Muslims see these issues is, is huge. Though not all Muslim women wear headscarf, a lot of American Muslim women who are wearing the headscarf are choosing to do that out of a point of identity and out of expression of their own freedom. I'm about to meet a police officer who is a woman, a Muslim, and wears a headscarf. Honestly, it's not easy to be a police officer these days, and for her to do it while wearing the headscarf is quite impressive. What kind of reactions did you get from the people? Generally very positive, but of course, with every good comes a bad. So there have been people with negative comments. Such as? Um, such as, I am not an American, I should... Um, go back to my country, it gets to you because this is somewhere that I was raised. I basically was born here. Do you feel you're an oppressed woman as a Muslim woman? Absolutely not. Were you forced to wear the hijab? Absolutely not. Did you choose that on your own? I definitely did. I've seen a quote before, if women are free to uh, be naked, why should they not be free to be covered? Now let's meet Asma. She chooses to wear the headscarf to exercise her freedom of choice, and she has been harassed for that choice. How are you? I'm good, thanks, how are you? Thanks. One of your friend's father was in the army, in the US Army. Yes. And I heard you had some yeah. encounter with that yeah. relationship. Tell me more about it. You know, he and I had always gotten along. I, I loved my friend's family, I still do. We were going to pick up groceries, and he asked me, why do you want to kill all the infidels? And I was like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? And he was like, well, you all, like, you want to kill us, right? Like, you you want to kill my daughter. And I was like, no, absolutely not. So it was scary for me, because I was like, this is what he really thinks of me? What made you decide to wear the hijab? Well, nobody in my family wears it. My mother doesn't wear it, my eldest sister doesn't wear it, none of my aunts, anybody. And how come you decided to wear it? For me, it was empowering, because I was saying, okay, I am a Muslim woman, I am empowered, I'm not oppressed, and I'm gonna wear the hijab now. So Asma, tell me, what, how come you have a dash cam? Uh, well, my dad got it for me, is a short answer. He got it for me because a few months ago, I was almost run off the road. I was in the car, I was coming home from a lecture, and a man kept cutting me off. So he was in front of me at a red light, and he tried backing into me, he started reversing. So I was like, oh, I was scared out of my mind. I was like, what is happening? And then at the next light, he was right next to me, and he rolled down his window, he flipped me off, and he called me a Muslim bitch. And then he proceeded to try and ram my car and run me off the road for the next three stoplights. Was that the first time you would get harassment? No. <laughs> I've been harassed on the road before, but this was the first time where I was really scared for my life. I'm here to meet Menar, who is the first TV host who's wearing a headscarf. Menar, you have a show called Behind the Headline that airs on Free Speech TV, and yet you operate out of undisclosed location. Why? Because we began to cover a lot of really controversial topics like war, Islamophobia, and I've received a lot of death threats online. I received a very, very scary message telling me that they hope that I get raped 
They hope that ISIS will come after me and my family and chop off my head. You're born and raised here in America. And many people will say, well, why do you have to wear the hijab? You are born and raised in America, you're here in America. Why are you wearing the hijab? Well, the story of me wearing hijab really started right after 9-11 when the media began to fear monger about Muslims. And I remember them showing images of these Afghan women uh, being really oppressed by the Taliban, which, you know, it happens and it's true. And they just showed these women as being really, you know, not able to speak up for themselves. And so I began to question my own faith and say, is this really what Islam teaches? I knew that wasn't the Islam that I had grown up to know. And so I did my own research and I realized that in essence, it was a protection of a woman's body. The hijab is a symbol of modesty and empowerment for women, and it is a sign of independence. You know, I think it be became more of a sense of identity for me. In Minneapolis, I heard many voices, including a group of Muslim women who are leaders in their community, as well as a Lutheran pastor, a Muslim imam, and a community activist who are working to overcome the myths and misunderstandings between Muslims and non-Muslims. People see women wearing hijab, and they believe and they think that someone has forced you to wear it. Is this the truth? And how did you come to wear the hijab? For me, the hijab is, is, is a choice. It, it is a symbol of my faith. In a way, it's my cross. It allows me to stand out uh, and, and shout to the world, I am a Muslim and I am happy to be a Muslim. I feel that this is my First Amendment right. The second this is required to be taken off, I think that's when our civil rights are being violated. So this to me is the most American thing I can do every day is to show up that we have a freedom of religion and expression. Many people think Muslim men are oppressing their women. So here I am talking with Muslim men. Are you oppressing your women? <laughs> you, you should Let's meet, get it out of the way. You should meet our wives to know that they are not oppressed. I think women in Islam have been way ahead in regards to education, enlightenment, equality in the Islamic world than in the West. 1920 is when they allowed women in this country to be able to vote, 1920. I think oppression of women is not, you know, a Muslim phenomenon or something that happens in the Middle East. I mean, we have women that are raped right here in the United States who are not Muslim. Um, but does oppression of Muslim women exist? Absolutely, and I think that we'd be lying to ourselves if we said it didn't. Oppression of women, I think it's not a phenomenon that just affects the Muslim community, but it's a global issue. Muslims right now are the new boogeymen of our time. So I wanna stand up and change the narrative, take back that narrative. Many of you are involved in interfaith dialogues. What are some of the interesting questions that people have asked you that they were timid or afraid to ask? Are you oppressed or, or is it true that you can't go to the grocery store without your uncle or your dad or your brother? Have you ever been afraid of being honor killed? Is your husband allowed to rape you and is that okay? Um, all sorts of different things. What do you say to these questions? I mean, it's okay for people to ask these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Every time I do a panel, I say, I want you, I actually need you to ask me those questions that you are afraid to ask because if you can't ask me, then I don't think you'll ever ask anyone. It is easy to succumb to fear. It's fear of the unknown. And the best way to, to break that fear is just to simply meet a Muslim. And by the way, 50, almost 50% 50 of Americans do not personally know any Muslim in their lives. Yeah. And that would help. That's what I'm hearing from mm -hmm. you is that yeah. knowing someone would, would help. Pastor Glenn, you did events in the church where you invited Muslims and non-Muslims to have a dialogue with each other. Can you tell me more about that? A series of events took place where we invited the Muslim community and the community of St. Anthony and anyone else around the, the Twin Cities. And the goal is for people to speak honestly about their questions, to ask the honest questions. I also wandered around the building making sure that if there were any of these questions that was getting a little heated, I could help mediate. And there were a few. Such as? Uh, one was in regard to Sharia. Mm. And I'll be honest with you, I don't completely understand myself. No one does. Uh, <laughs> Just to let, not Muslims even, not even Muslims do understand. First of all, what is Sharia? Okay. And is there such an agenda, by the way, to impose Sharia on this country? Absolutely That's not. Just to clarify it, you know. <laughs>
Well, Sharia is, is Islamic law, basically. So Sharia, for instance, affects marriage, divorce, inheritance. Where do I get buried Why when I die? Why do you think Sharia has such a negative connotation? Because we have narrowed down, or the concept has narrowed down Sharia to just the punishment for certain crimes. Mm -hmm. So if you narrow down, Islam, let's say, American law to what happens to a rapist or what happens to somebody who kills a child, whether it's capital punishment or and we say you know, incarceration. And we say all of the law for, is about capital capital punishment, yes. then of course it demonizes us. The thing is, there is not one Sharia law. You know, there are many laws interpreted in different countries, in different regions, and it's, it's not one document. I first heard about Sharia law when I was in high school. Like, I had no idea growing up. People think it's like, you know, a, like a main tenet of Islam to like, you know, instill, install Sharia law everywhere we go. And it isn't. Like, I didn't even know what it was. I often tell individuals who say, do you want to bring Sharia law to America? <laughs> and I'll always say, oh, you have to have more faith in the Constitution. <laughs> I recently had a conversation with a gentleman who really was genuinely fearful about the Muslim community. And I, I shared with him a very simple reality about myself. I said, I have contributed to the prejudice, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly. And for me, it was very important for me to stop and be honest about what I have done and what I haven't done. It's tough to be able to deal with fear unless you're honest about that fear. What are you gonna use your energy for? To be afraid? To be a part of the problem? Or are you going to use your energy to get to know someone by name as a person? We had a community dialogue where we brought together people who had questions about Islam and Muslims. There were some individuals who were passing out you know, anti-Muslim pamphlets and some of that material. And so afterwards, a woman who I had earlier seen passing out this information, she came up to me and so she had learned something. She said, oh, so you wear this, you know, point to my hijab, to emulate Mary. And so, and then she gave me a hug. And it was such a beautiful moment, you know, here earlier, she's passing out this hate literature and now she understands. That's beautiful, that's beautiful. I have to say, I'm very emotional, actually. It's heartbreaking. People are hurt. Um, Muslims are hurt. This, this reminds me of a book called Identity and Violence by Amartya Sen, a Nobel Peace Laureate. And he says, when you corner someone and tell them you are only one thing and you strip them away from all other identities, then they are doctors and engineers and mothers and fathers and daughters and, and, and husbands and wives, and you tell them you are just bad, they eventually become that. Well, this has not happened in the Muslim community here. On the opposite, there are people who are showing up and engage in uncomfortable conversations. It's in a way sad to have to see this tension here in America. And in a way, it's, it gives me hope. They are goodness. They are good people out there who are really, really trying. And we all should be part of this dialogue. We all should be part of this movement.